Leaders from South America's 12 nations meet in Brazil. Their host, President Lula da Silva, is calling for more unity and even a new single currency. So what are his plans and could they become reality? And what's bringing these countries together now? This is Inside Story. Hello, welcome to the program. I'm Adrian Finnegan. South America's biggest nation has played host to the continent's leaders. It's part of a drive by Brazil's left-wing president, Luis Ignacio Lula da Silva, to create a regional political and economic bloc. There's strength in unity, as the saying goes, and it's one of the former trade union leader will be hoping applies to neighbouring states too. A single currency for South America is one plan he's keen to develop to reduce dependency on the US dollar. He wants more cooperation in areas that include trade, health care, the environment and fighting organised crime. But the presence of Venezuela's President Nicolas Maduro caused some division. Our Latin America editor Lucia Newman tells us more from Brasilia on what was discussed behind closed doors. It is the first time in nearly a decade that leaders of all the South American countries actually sit down face to face, actually behind closed doors, and speak frankly about the possibility of finally put, right, laying out the groundwork for regional integration. It is something that they all feel strongly about, particularly at a time when the world is forming into different blocks. They all believe that South America has to have a voice. It is a economically important part of the world. Uh, altogether, they make up uh, the fifth largest economic bloc in the world. And uh, right now, their voices are not being heard because they are divided. Certainly, that seems to be the, what the argument that they are making. However, it's been very difficult to bring about. President Lula, when he was last president, uh, created UNASUR, and that is the Union of South American Nations that was supposed to be the, the building block for this regional integration. However, it fell apart when the political pendulum in this region swung from the left to the right. The presence of Venezuela's leader, Nicolás Maduro, was somewhat divisive. Some of the presidents believe that he is an authoritarian leader and they had no problem telling him so to his face. But Maduro was actually very conciliatory. He simply did not answer the criticisms and said that he was happy to just agree to disagree on those issues. In the end, all the presidents were happy to be able to all sit down together for the first time in so long and work towards something that they all believe is important. As President Lula said, uh, after 500 years, and that is a reference to the arrival of Columbus in the Americas, we finally have to be able to leave from the margins and have our voices heard. Well, this isn't Lula da Silva's first attempt to create unity. In 2008, he led efforts to establish UNISA, a regional bloc modelled on the European Union to integrate the 12 South American nations. But a swing to the political right on the continent led to the group fracturing. Disagreements over its leadership and Venezuelan President Nicolas Maduro's involvement led to seven countries withdrawing after 2017. South America's population is nearly 450 million, that's around 5.5% of the world's population. This year, the region's GDP is estimated to be just over $4 trillion, about a quarter of that of the EU. The continent is rich in natural resources. Brazil is the second largest producer of iron ore, while Chile produces around a third of the world's copper. It's also the second biggest producer of the increasingly sought-after mineral lithium. So let's bring in our guests for today's discussion. From Caracas, we're joined by Tamia Porras Ponceleon, Managing Director of Global Sovereign Advisory. He was Deputy Minister and Senior Aide to former President Hugo Chavez and President Nicolas Maduro's Chief of Staff. From Bayonne is Guillaume, uh, Guillaume Long, Senior Analyst at uh, the Centre for Economic and Policy Research and a former Foreign Minister of Ecuador. And from Miami... Danny Shaw, Professor of Latin American and Caribbean Studies at City University, New York. He's also an uh, international affairs analyst for TV network Tele. So uh, a warm welcome to you all. Um, Danny, let's start uh, with you. President Lula da Silva has made no secret of the fact that he would like to revive uh, this regional body, UNISOR, the Union of South American uh, Nations. Is it actually a good idea, though? Uh, what chance 
of uh, uniting such a divided block of nations? That's, of course, one of the main challenges. UNASUR could be powerful now that Lula is in power and there's other, some other left-leaning presidencies uh, in Bolivia. Um, Mexico certainly moved in a more anti-imperialist direction. Uh, of course, um, Nicaragua, Cuba, Venezuela have long opposed U.S. foreign policy across the uh, hemisphere. The challenge is that, you know, what if a Bolsonaro-esque type figure is elected in any any country in the upcoming years that will immediately divide this attempt at unity and integration. So it's very important what we've seen in the past uh, few days with this UNASUR uh, coming together, but there's a long way to go. Uh, we see voices that want more integration with the North, with the United States and the European Union, then they want integration with their own South American and Caribbean <clears throat> neighbors. So it will not be an easy feat to achieve this unity in an ongoing way. <laughs> Guillaume, uh, is it a, a realistic ambition for South America to have its own version of, of the EU or, or uh, African Union? How does the continent move past organizations that ultimately turn into clubs for ideologically aligned allies? What, what tangible benefits would such a grouping need to deliver to outlast the continent's ever-shifting political landscape? Sure. So Latin American integration has been a long-lasting dream of the Latin American region. Uh, it goes back to the 19th century. South American integration, which is what we're talking about, is a bit more recent. It has its roots in actually a Brazilian consensus, broadly speaking, between the center-left and the center-right. It starts in the 90s, even the the center-right then under President Cardoso was in favor of South American regional space. And then much more decisively under Lula in the first decade of this century, uh, the community of South American nations was created in 2004. And then finally in 2008, uh, UNASUR with the 12 member states. In fact, it was created as a non-ideological, non-political uh, forum. It had 12 countries, some on the left, some on the right, and the only common denominator was geography. You had to be a South American nation. But then... Um, from 2015, 2016 onwards, there's a shift to the right and quite radical right. And from 2019 onwards in Brazil, you know, so Bolsonaro, uh, sort of very radical and reactionary right, accompanied by Trump in the United States, who uh, encouraged Latin American countries to drop this dream, to abandon South American unity and to return to the sort of uh, the fold of Monroeism, which is often a term we use in Latin America, you know, the Monroe Doctrine, the U U.S. hegemony in the hemisphere, and the expression, the, organi the organization which best embodies this is the Organization of American States, which has its headquarters in Washington, which is uh, tightly managed and controlled by the U.S., and of course the U.S. hasn't really wanted an independent group of state with strategic autonomy such as UNASUR. Now, with the shift to the left, uh, we're seeing the possibility of UNASUR being rekindled, but obviously, the, the, we saw it yesterday at the summit. I mean, Lula really wants some more reasonable right-wing characters, figures, presidents, so on and so forth, to sort of understand that it's in the strategic interest of the region. Lula doesn't want it to be a club of leftists. He, wanted, he wants everybody on board from all sides of the political spectrum to understand that South American uh, regionalism, a South American organization, UNASUR, is in the collective interest of all 12 countries in a world which as you said at the beginning of this show, is going to be increasingly uh, dominated by regional blocs uh, with a new Cold War you know, emerging on the horizon, and you're going to need some kind of regional geopolitics and muscle to face the challenges of the future. Uh, Tamir, while a majority of South, Afri uh, South American leaders are, are currently uh, leftist or uh, centrists, the region is more idealistically pluralistic than it's been for some time right now. I mean, there is no guarantee, is there, that things will stay this way? It's only, is, it, is it perhaps just a matter of time before a grouping like the one that, that President Lula da Silva falls apart again uh, on ideological grounds? Uh, is this the best way to, to achieve the unity among South American nations that, that President Lula da Silva is looking for? Well, um, that is the price of uh, democracy in, in, in Latin America. Um, uh, I mean, in, in Latin America, polit politics are competitive. Uh, you can have uh, changes in government and alternation in power. 
Um, and it's the people of the countries of South America who, who decide that uh, those changes. And I would say happily, <laughs> to some extent, uh, uh, those alternations happen, happen regularly. But on the other hand, um, I would, I mean, President Lula couldn't have said it uh, uh, better yesterday by, um, by giving an example. Um, Brazil and Argentina, for instance, uh, have uh, a bilateral trade that can amount to 30, 35 billion dollars per year. That is, that is massive, that is very, very important. And in a way, he was comparing that trade between Brazil and Argentina uh, to the trade that uh, happens every year between Brazil and the European Union, that is probably only eight to nine billion dollars. So uh, he was, by giving that example, um, explaining that this uh, integrationist effort needs to be very pragmatic and uh, that the trade between Brazil and Argentina is crucial for uh, the companies and the businesses in both countries. So why not finding ways um, to um, not only improve the conditions for that, uh, that trade to happen, and, and for example, one of the, uh, one of the uh, ideas that he put on the table was why not building a common currency that would allow Brazil and Argentina to uh, perform that uh, trade exchange without resorting to U.S. dollar. Why should Brazil and Argentina trade in U.S. dollars among them and, in, and instead uh, find, find a regional arrangement? So uh, the more that integration goes into very practical uh, aspects like the one I'm quoting, and, or for instance, you could say today is very difficult for South American students to go from one country to another and come back uh, to their countries and, and just, you know, exercise uh, their profession with a uh, degree or a diploma obtained in, in a fellow uh, South American nation. So the moment you start moving into that direction and the people see the concrete benefits, it's going to be very much uh, harder for uh, any other government or, cons uh, you know, as conservative as it could be to explain to their populations that they're, they're walking away from such a I would say, pragmatic and beneficial arrangement. Uh, and to me, just briefly, what, what would a, a, a regional trade currency look like? No, I mean, it's, it's, it's something that could be, you know, what was in existence in, in the, in the uh, European community before the existence of the euro. What you need is to, uh, is to have mechanisms. You don't, you don't actually need to move to a formal common currency because that would require, um, I mean, a long-lasting effort of convergence of the uh, different monetary policies that probably is a, it, it's a bit ambitious to, uh, or, or probably is not even suitable. That's a debate that the, uh, the countries need to have. But why not having, you know, a, 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 a common, uh, common um, uh, currency that, that simply allows, you know, the different central banks to compensate their trade, you know th those tools, as as Guillaume said, existed in the past. You know, we, I mean, the, the Latin American inter integration is not uh, is not a new idea. Um, what we need is to use uh, those tools, uh, for instance, to just uh, improve um, the uh, the uh, interdependency of our of our regions and see in which in which aspects in which areas of the economy it makes sense. Uh, to integrate further. I would just take one example, the energy. That's something that President Lula talked about yesterday. Why would some South American nations import their gas or oil from a very remote region when, you know, Brazil, Venezuela have uh, immense reserves just because there's no, you know, there's no pipelines in the, in the region. So those pipelines, those infrastructures need to be built. And that needs to be a, a, a common effort uh, in order to, uh, to uh, you know, to, to, to allow for those for those um, uh, projects to happen. Okay, Danny, the, the presence of uh, President Maduro at, at the summit made some leaders, even left-leaning ones, uh, uncomfortable. Did uh, President Lula da Silva go too far in his embrace of Venezuela's president? That's certainly been the <clears throat> headline in Bloomberg and the New York Times and the full game of uh, U.S. media outlets here in the U.S. You can't even mention uh, Venezuela. <clears throat> There's no objective analysis. There's no sociological, historical, uh, critical understanding. 
of everything that's happened in Venezuela, just like there's a Russia phobia, uh, there's a Venezuela phobia, there's a new Cold War uh, mentality. Why shouldn't the elected representatives of all countries, uh, as, as the guest said, regardless of their uh, ide ideology, this is a, a, a geographic unity that they're trying to build. So, of course, uh, leadership from out the continent should be uh, invited. Uh, it's so important to break this dollar dependency, um, the debt traps, the structural adjustment programs from the IMF and the World Bank have some have done so much uh, damage. A common currency can begin to break uh, this historical dollar dependency, the supremacy of the dollar. And what Washington has consistently done is they have vilified any presidency, any leadership, any country uh, that has tried to oppose their uh, unipolar designs for the region. That's why we have, I think, what can only be termed as uh, sensationalism against Nicolas Maduro. Uh, Guillaume, uh, Lula said that there was very large prejudice against the country and that the image of an anti-democratic Venezuela was a narrative promoted by the Western countries imposing harsh sanctions that exacerbate the country's humanitarian and economic crisis. Did he, as Chile's president has uh, argued, make light of uh, human rights violations in, in Venezuela? I think Lula's approach to Venezuela is a response to a growing consensus that isolating Venezuela has been uh, counterproductive, has created actually uh, much of the problems that are criticized. We can see if you look at the uh, evolution of uh, Venezuelan GDP or even uh, Venezuelan migration. And there's been a lot of talk of Venezuelan migration in the region, but also to the United States. Uh, and if you look at if you look at uh, the evolution of those figures over the last few years, there's a, you know, the origins lie in the sanctions. Latin Americans are more and more aware that the sanctions have been causing, uh, well, Venezuela, for example, not to be able to export its main export, oil, which obviously leads to Venezuela uh, facing great uh, economic and social hardship. And then this obviously having a trickle down effect on uh, poverty and on migration and so on and so forth. So I think Generally speaking, in the region, Lula was speaking for his government, but there's a growing consensus, even in the mainstream diplomacy, that the sanctions have not worked. Not only have they not uh, uh, achieved regime change, which was the open and admitted uh, goal of the United States, but they've actually created a broader regional crisis, uh, and everybody's kind of fed up with this and wants to move on. Um, and I think it's important to... This, to insert this in this kind of return of UNASUR and return of South American geopolitics and the 12 uh, South American heads of state getting together to discuss things. And, you know, some, in, as you said, you know, in, in agreeing to disagree and sometimes having harsh words for each other, but all sitting at the table uh, and discussing this in contrast to what has happened over the last few years in the Organization of American States. Uh, it's important to remember that the Trump administration actually managed to get a self-proclaimed president with no legitimacy, Juan Guaido, to be the representative of Venezuela in the OAS. Which is, there's, there's no precedent to that. You know, there was no sort of opposition to Pinochet or even to Fidel Castro sitting in some you know invented uh, seat at the OAS. This is a completely new thing, a very taboo thing. And clearly, at the United Nations and in other, other multilateral. Uh, for uh, it's the Venezuela of Nicolas Maduro, you know, in international law, uh, the country which the, the, the government which represents the country is the government which controls territory and controls institutions. This is international law. But somehow uh, the United States and the OES, current OAS Secretary General, invented the fact that some figure of the opposition could suddenly take the seat of Venezuela in the Organization of American States. And this shocked, I would say, even mainstream diplomats, not necessarily leftists. And so what we saw yesterday with Lula receiving Maduro and then Maduro actually, you know, having a meeting with the other 11 presidents of the region, some of them who dislike Maduro strongly, uh, uh, you know, undoubtedly, uh, that is kind of a return of, I think, a yearn to negotiate, a yearn to have diplomacy as opposed to just regime change. Uh, this attempt at regime change in Venezuela has been ongoing now. There, was actually, there were several coup attempts in 2019 which failed. Maduro still there. I think the general consensus, even amongst people who and presidents who dislike Maduro, is that they're going to have to sit down with Maduro and come to some kind of modus vivendi and some kind of agreement. And I think that was uh, Lula's 
you know, the, the spirit of Lula's meeting with Maduro yesterday. OK, uh, Tamir, I, I mean, I don't, don't want to spend too much of the programme talking about uh, Venezuela in particular, but what's the view from Caracas on this? Why is it so important now to bring Venezuela in from the cold? Well, it, it is very important because, uh, on the one hand, Venezuela's economy is starting to, you know, grow again. Uh, and, and Venezuela, in a way, has shown that it, it's, it's problems that nobody denies uh, can only be solved by Venezuelans. And that uh, foreign interference, as uh, Guillaume uh, mentioned, um, uh, especially uh, when, when it is the imposition of sanctions and, and an openly regime change policy, which was what was uh, applied to Venezuela during, during the Trump administration, uh, only brings, you know, hardship uh, for the people of, uh, of a country and, and, and um, makes uh, finding solutions, sensible, you know, durable solutions uh, more, more difficult. So now that the Venezuela has, has overcome uh, that critical period, it is time for the region to focus on a, uh, an, a, a, an agenda that is more, uh, that has more to do with what can the countries do to work together in, in order to improve their situation, rather than uh, having an institution that is only there for, you know, one country criticizing another or uh, uh, groupings of countries uh, basically pointing out uh, what they dislike about the internal politics of a, of a different country. For instance, I, I will give you an example. Um, uh, Peru. You know, Peru has been extremely uh, unstable, uh, probably not had an elected leader uh, finishing its term for, for, uh, for over a decade. And, and still, there is no international mobilization, you know, to, to meddle in, in the Peruvian internal affairs. Uh, why does it happen in Venezuela? Well, because Venezuela is home to the uh, world's largest oil reserves. And uh, because the government of Venezuela has had an approach to the management of those reserves that probably is not of the taste uh, of the United States administration or, or, or some major oil companies. So okay. again, um, um, the regional agenda should be more centered about uh, finding okay. solutions than meddling in each other's uh, problems. Danny, you, you touched upon it uh, in, in your last answer. How does the US view a more uh, united and therefore assertive grouping of South American nations and, and, and this regional currency that, that would be designed to rival the U.S. dollar? The U.S. foreign policy establishment is uh, dead set against the success of a sur, of a South American and Caribbean unifying uh, currency. Marco Rubio last month uh, on Fox News expressed that if there was no longer uh, dependency on the dollar, if the dollar no longer reigned supreme, then these countries could begin the sanction, the club of the sanction, the club of the blockaded. Uh, Marco Rubio is a, is a representative of the uh, Republicans and of the U.S. foreign policy establishment, was, was very, very afraid that Caracas could find Tehran, and Tehran could find La Paz, Bolivia, and La Paz could find uh, Mexico City, and Mexico City could find Beijing. So all roads these days seem to lead away from uh, Washington. That's why there's so much fear. That's why they got behind this coup attempt against Pedro uh, Castillo in Peru. And they're now supporting the coup government of, of Boluarte that had representation in, in Brasilia yesterday. Um, <clears throat> they're doing everything to pivot towards uh, Gabriel Boric. Uh, Boric seems to spend more time critiquing uh, Caracas than he does uh, Washington, when his own country was the victim and survivor of the 9-11-1973 uh, coup. So I, I certainly think that Boric has to sit down and re-examine his talking points and his uh, priorities. We've seen a more bold um, Lopez Obrador. We've never heard a, a Mexican presidency since the 1950s speak in these national, uh, nationalist and internationalist uh, uh, terms. So I do think overall the second iteration of the pink tide, the synthesis is more South American integration and, and, and unity and true self-determination. 
But as we're hearing, uh, there's many, many challenges coming from the hegemony of the North, who doesn't want to see the rise of this multipolar world that's on the okay. horizon. And it's in construction right now in Brasilia, uh, in South Africa, uh, and across the world. OK, Danny, uh, uh, Guillaume, uh, we've got about two minutes left of, uh, uh, of the programme. Um, one final question. To, to what extent is President Lula uh, trying to establish Brazil uh, as the region's leader? How do other South American states view Brazil right now? And are they willing to fall into line behind it politically? I think it's going to take a little while. There are a few governments, we saw it in the summit yesterday, who are kind of resisting this idea of UNASUR. I mean, one of them, the government of Uruguay, the president who exited UNASUR, I like to use the word Brexit, you know, because that's really what it looked like at the time, is still the current president. So obviously, for the, for the president of Uruguay, uh, Mr. Lacay, it's kind of uncomfortable to have left UNASUR and to have to go back in. Whereas all the other ones, maybe they were in favor of it at the time, but they weren't actually president. They weren't actually the ones that left the union. So it's less of a problem to go back in and uh, uh, yeah, accept uh, uh, Lula's uh, invitation. So I think it's going to happen uh, in the medium to long term. We now have seven members of UNASUR out of the 12 original members. So there's still five countries that have to go back in. That's Colombia, Chile, Uruguay, Paraguay, and Ecuador. But the other seven are firmly back in with Brazil and Argentina recently going back in in the month of April. Uh, and yeah, Brazilian leadership and Lula's leadership, for sure, plays an important role. Uh, and it's an old Brazilian dream. There are two South American subsystems, uh, the Atlantic Ocean of South America, which is dominated by the Mercosur, that common market of the Atlantic, and on the Pacific, the Andean side, the Pacific, uh, historically the community of Andean states and the alliance. Uh, but those two subsystems don't really communicate with each other. And one of the uh, historic geopolitical goals of Brazil being to try and unify both the Pacific coast with the Atlantic coast in one big geopolitical area, okay. not just market, but political area as well. And I think that's likely to outlive Lula. We had the exception with Bolsonaro, but I think that was a big phenomenon. I think it's likely to continue in Brazilian foreign policy, and I think it's likely to be successful. Gentlemen, we're out of time. Many thanks indeed for being with us. Tamir Porras Ponceleon, Guillaume Long and uh, Danny Shaw. And thank you for watching. Don't forget you can see the programme again at any time by going to the website. AljazeeRa.com is where you'll find it. For further discussion, join our Facebook page. That's at facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. And you can join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle at AJ Inside Story. From me, Adrian Finnegan, and the team here at Doha, thanks for being with us. We'll see you again. Bye for now.